Our next speaker, uh, Raymond Pritchett, a uh, longtime uh, blogger, and really just a great insightful stuff over the years that all of us in the Navy read uh, every day. Uh, so we're really happy to have Raymond here. Welcome back to Annapolis. Thank you. These are really cool. I love these type of engagements where I get to go out and speak with the Navy at various institutions. I've had an opportunity to do it at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey and, and the War College in Newport and now here at uh, Annapolis. Uh, it's interesting because I come from a background where it's more tech oriented. I did not go to college and yet I find myself in university settings all the time. And I am mostly the computer nerd so it made a lot of sense for uh, Claude to ask me to talk about video games because I probably represent the demographics the congressman was talking about <laughs> where you, you don't necessarily leave your basement. I do uh, actually have that basement. Um, but it's got a lot more than just computer games going on in there. Uh, we found out on November 1st with the release of the CIA uh, dossier about Osama bin Laden's uh, compound that he played video games. And that surprises some people, but it didn't surprise me because it carries all the video gamers in general are usually caught up into hacker culture and they carry a lot of the similarities that you would find in the asymmetric warfare space, the irregular warfare space. So I'm, I was not surprised. I was surprised by some of the video games he played. Um, I was particularly impressed with the uh, Super Mario Brother video game emulators that he used. I think he had four of them. So he was a big fan of Mario and Luigi. And he also played a role-playing game called Final Fantasy VII, which I don't know anything about, so I can't really speak to it. But he played Counter-Strike, which is a multiplayer game, a first-person shooter game where terrorists shoot soldiers, and it makes you wonder which side Osama bin Laden played. He, but he also played Half-Life, which is a science fiction game. And Half-Life is an interesting game because it's soldiers versus aliens. So he seemed to find a lot of uh, interesting things about video gaming culture in general. But it struck me that the reason that he played those video games was probably not mentioned in the CIA dossier. Uh, video game culture is a great way to communicate with others. It's part of the social world that I think Matthew Hippel discussed earlier that kind of brings us all together. It's possible that he was playing those games because they use Steam mostly. Most of the games that he had were Steam based and he did have Steam installed. And it's probable that the reason that he was using Steam is because Steam is famous for not saving their chat logs. So everything that he said would be outside of the normal NSA monitoring program that goes on on normal technology protocols uh, and within a context of an, a platform that doesn't save chat. So he's basically able to circumvent the NSA by playing video games. That's a cool way to do your job if you're a terrorist. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit, being in a museum, about the earliest video games because uh, I'm, I am a history nerd and I think that the first video game, because it has that science fiction focus, is worth mentioning. It actually came out in 1962 at MIT and Harvard. Uh, what happened was is IBM was dominating the computer market at that time and they, the Digital Equipment Corporation decided that they wanted a computer, so they worked with MIT and they built something called the PDP-1. And the PDP-1 was a, basically a computer, it looked a little bit like this. That's the, the graphic there, or, or the uh, monitor system that they had for it. And it was built for human interaction, which is a little different than most computers at the time. Uh, it was the soft, um, so after PDP, uh, DEC produced the PDP-1 with MIT, they gave the prototype back to what's known as the, the Mo Tech Model Railroad Club of MIT. And that's like the precursor to the <coughs> jargon file. If you're, if you're a nerd like me, you know what the jargon file is. You might know what some of the other uh, tech groups, um, clubs and stuff of that nature at MIT and at Harvard are. The, the Tech Model Railroad Club was really the precursor to all of that in the 1960s. So they had this computer and a, a man by the name of Steve Russell was able to procure a grant from the DOD and to build software that would utilize the full resources of this amazing new computer system that they have, and this club would do it. And naturally, uh, Steve and his buddies of the, the college club, imagine that, uh, they, they loved science fiction. So inspired by a game, uh, uh, novels that were written by El, uh, Edward Elmer Smith, the, the Lensman series, the Skylark series of the that early science fiction novels. 
they just, he decided that we're going to build a really cool game called Space War! Exclamation point. And the exclamation point does exist in the game. Uh, Space War is essentially two ships that shoot each other. You can see this on the screen, there's like dots of light. That's actually part of the effect of the stars going past you. You may not know this, but that effect, because it was part of this video game, and the video game was, at the time, there's a lot of hack hacker culture, so they gave stuff out for free. That has essentially become an effect that is free in science fiction today, which is why you see it when you jump to light speed in Star Wars, or if you go to warp speed in Star Trek, that effect is free, so they don't have to pay for it, so obviously they use it. <laughs> um, but it, it's actually sourced to the video game. And what they did is during the space age, they took all the physics that they had at the time, and they created the software that utilized the maximum resources of the, the computer, which is what the DoD grant was intended for. And they started playing it, and it was, I mean, pretty awesome. One ship, one ship. You can do a hyper jump, and every time you do a hyper jump, you increase the s chances that you're going to blow yourself up, or you might crash into the planet, or the other player might kill you. And it's a very tactical game and kind of neat. Steve Russell uh, was essentially invented the first major resource using computer program, a video game. The PDP 1 was famous for that type of stuff. It was the first computer that we had, we got like things like the, the program debugger, the text editor, um, the word processor, if you ever use that, you know, like all of us. Um, and then he ended up going off to Seattle, and you can read the rest of his story, I think it's in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, where he was the uh, mentor for the Lakeside High School Computer Club that helped people like Bill Gates and Paul Allen learn how to program. But uh, so it's the same person who created the first video game. It also happens to be one of the main primary mentors at a young age for some of America's greatest technical titans. Um, but the real nature of computer games is that it's, it started in the competitive space. And it's competitive computer gaming that kind of got my attention. And as I was talking with Claude, that maybe that's why he asked me to come out here. Um, it is within the context of competitive computer gaming that we see a lot of uh, associations with irregular warfare and asymmetric warfare today. And it's kind of evolved as computer games, particularly science fiction computer games, have evolved. So the, you know, there's not a lot of uh, tremendous uh, things going on in the computer gaming industry in the or, uh, 80s and 90s, um, or the 70s and 80s, rather, as they lead up. It's arcade stuff, so we play Galaga, we play Asteroids, and we get to see the little effect for Asteroids. And we get into the, the Wing Commanders is kind of a neat little science fiction game. But then all of a sudden in uh, 1991, the internet comes and hey, now we can play against other people. And one of the things that started in early internet gaming is a play by email. And this is actually something that is a, a format of gaming that most people have never heard of. But it was very popular among academics because it can be turn-based. You create your, you play the game at your turn you package your game into a little file and you email it off to the host. And all of the players email the host. And then the host runs the turn and repackages it out. And the, there was only two of these games, both of them science fiction, ironically, that were out there. The one that had the most market share was VGA Planets. And VGA Planets was, <laughs> man, this is the coolest game ever. And I played it, I have to admit. I learned, I learned how to play v, VGA Planets at the bulletin board service before it got ported over to computers. Uh, at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. Tremendous game. It had 11 races. You could play 11 on 11 multiplayer, which is unheard of in the early, in 1990, literally. Uh, he, these were the 11 races. The Federation, the Gorn, the Romulans, the Klingons, the Orions, the Borg, and then we'll skip number seven because that's always a little bit iffy. Uh, the Empire from Star Wars, the Rebel Alliance, the Cylons and the Colonials from Battlestar Galactica, and you get to fight each other. And that is so cool for a nerd like me who is like 16 years old and uh, best in the computer world. This is the best game ever. In 1992, they released version three for the internet and they sold 450,000 copies. And that's a lot of games where you're playing against each other, partic particularly on the international market. That seventh race was either the Tholians, if you're a Star Trek fan, or if you were a creative artist, you would call it the Kilraithi because you're a Wing Commander fan and we we're talking about computer games. But it didn't matter because it really wasn't so much about the game. I always played the Colonials from Battlestar Galactica because they're cool. And you could go out and you're out flying your battle stars and you're colonizing the, 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 the galaxy. There's a map of 100 planets. 
Everyone's competing to colonize those planets and take over each other. And if I f run into the Borg, I got them. I can take out the Borg, I'm the Colonials. But if I ran into the Romulans, I got a problem because the Romulans can cloak. And then all of a sudden, something happened. And Computer Gaming Weekly, which was the, or Computer Gaming Monthly, which was the uh, computer gaming magazine at the time that was so popular, we used to use magazines to judge games. Yes, I know, it's weird. But this was before the internet was that big. Um, they said that VGA Planets was the game of the year honorable mention because it can't win. It's not a real video game in real time. It's played by email, so we can't mention it. But there's something about it, and that's something that made VGA Planet special was essentially its metagame. Because if I'm running along and I'm the Colonials and I run into the Romulans, I go out to the website and I find out who's playing the Romulans. And it was always some guy named Sergi from Moscow. And I'd have to figure out how to talk to Sergi in Moscow not to destroy my ships. Because if I see a cloaked, if I see a non-cloaked Romulan, I'm already dead. He already knows where I'm at. I'm about to die. I'm trying to talk Sergi into not destroying me. In other words, it's a metagame. It's government, it's politics, it's business, it's diplomacy. And it's taking place in the context of a video game. And it is within this metagame space that we have seen since about 1991 in multiplayer gaming that has expanded what irregular warfare, what asymmetric warfare is. It's not what's happening in the game. Game designers are good at designing games, but they aren't necessarily good at designing the way games are played because humans are good at playing games and humans will find a way to do what humans do, which is win. We don't like to lose. So we move on from the, the 90s play by email stuff and computer gaming takes a new leap. It gets into Star uh, Starcraft, which is the uh, precursor to Warcraft or World of Warcraft. Actually, it's after Warcraft, but before World of Warcraft. <laughs> Blizzard created this game. It sold 10 million copies. It was incredibly popular. It was also the most bootleg game in the 1990s and it came out in 1998. How do you do that? That's because everybody learned how to cheat and steal. But that's also kind of what the game was about. No, it, it is. And the thing is, is that it, it invented what PC Gamer Magazine has called for the last almost 20 years, the greatest race ever created. And I call it the Wayne Hughes race. And if you know Wayne Hughes, he's a, he's a tremendous strategist out, that was out at the Naval uh, Postgraduate School forever. But it's essentially a tactically used race for numerically superior, low technology, low cost, fast, weak assets that defeat enemies through a strategy of attrition. Oh, that's a Jerry, I'm sorry, Jerry, that's a Jerry Hendricks race. <laughs> <laughs> well, it kind of is, isn't it? Isn't that what we look at as the zenith of autonomous vehicles in Navy space? We want to have this amazing number of low cost, cheap, synchronized awesomeness that comes and blows up the enemy and can do it all, all in synchronization and coordination, although it's never happened in nature, unless you count the bait ball where they always lose. Uh, that's the bait ball of fish, if you're not familiar with that. Well, and the bumblebee, which doesn't actually do that, except that one time with that one wasp in Asia. I mean, seriously, there's nothing like that anywhere, except in Zerg. And so I'm, I, when I started writing for the Navy, I was always amused that the, the General Dynamics engineers and the uh, Northrop Grumman engineers would actually say the word Zerg. And I'm the only person who knows what they're talking about, <laughs> except for the Danger Room reporters because they were young like me and they played StarCraft too. Although I never actually played StarCraft. But I knew the word because it ended up becoming kind of ingrained in culture. Zerg is essentially, if you're not any good, but you have a whole lot of people and you beat me and my team loses because of your overwhelming numbers, then that's a Zerg and I'm, you know, you suck. Zerg <laughs> suck. And that's where it comes from. It must be amazing because they seem to win. And they did win. In, in StarCraft, what they did is they just started building a whole bunch of stuff and they'd send it and annihilate you before you could build up your defenses. And that's generally the idea of any swarm where if, if as long as you're able to get to the enemy where within some sort of range, where you're able to approach the enemy and you can essentially overwhelm them and do whatever you need to do and before they're able to put up the defense, because if they are able to defense, you're low cost and low tech and you're going to die. And I continuously question whether or not autonomous vehicles will actually get to this point because I'm not convinced that's the greatest capability there is for unmanned vehicles because if you have low cost and low tech, you can be defeated very easily. 
probably easier than you think. But it worked in StarCraft, and that was something. <coughs> it, it is. It, but what happened also in the late 90s, and then starting in 2000s, is we saw uh, this metagame culture start expanding with the multi, the MMO, rise of MMOs, as they say, the multiplayer, massive multiplayer online games. I'm gonna get that right eventually. Um, I actually know a little bit about this, but not because I'm all caught up in it yet. I need to be, there's a cool game out there today I'll talk about here in a minute, and it's sci-fi even, but I've never played it. But the, uh, the, the game that kind of caught my attention in looking at it, from a massive multiplayer online gaming verse perspective, is the game Ultima Online. And it was one of the first, and it came out in the late 90s, I think it was released in early, or late 1997, and it got 300,000 players to play within the context of this virtual world, and that's kind of neat. You got a whole lot of people that are playing. And they did something because they were one of the first, the very second, I think was the second MMO ever created. They did something that no one else has done, or except for one company since. They left the governance of the society up to the people. Bad idea. People will take that and run with it. And it turns out that not all people are nice. Um, so what they did is for, it, within the Ultima online world, you, they started finding these people who had, you know, lots, they really wanted to kill other people and they would find other people like them who really wanted to kill other people in the game. And they started forming these giant guilds. And yet there was so much competition among those guilds that they actually broke down into small roving groups. They're, they never could really get big. And there was a couple of different reasons, but for the most part, you were part of one of these king groups if you had three specific characteristics. We're talking about the late 90s and the early 2000s. So the first thing you had to do is you had to have Pentium because all of a sudden processing and compute really mattered. You had to have an AMD overclocked or you had to have some sort of compute, a Pentium Pro, a Pentium 2. These things mattered because if you didn't have that, you were lagging and that's not good if you're competing particularly in real time. You would run up and start to freeze as the enemy kills you. The other problem was, and resources was, it was just more than just compute though. It was also memory. It was about sound. It was about the video card revolution that was taking place at this time. And then there was also this other factor taking place in technology called broadband. Only a handful of people had it. It was only the people in the cities. So you had these people with ISDNs or T1s or broadband and really, really good computers, and they are clearly the most skilled because they have the most resources. And then you had everybody else who was trying to compete, and they created these roaming bands within the, the, the game. And then the third thing they did is because they had resources to spare on their computer side, and they had broadband, they didn't care what their command and control communication was. So they used uh, voice chat. They were one of the first groups that used command and control through voice communications. And then on the other side, they had uh, people with less capable computers, less capable, um, you know, dial-up. Anybody remember dial-up? Uh, yeah, they had made use IRC because it didn't use the compute and the bandwidth resources that you had. But these, these guys that didn't have all this stuff, they decided we're just going to make one big team. And on every server, you'd have one of these groups. And they were the biggest, and they were the baddest, and they were always winning. Even against all of these monster, super capable teams, they would just co totally overrun them in small groups. But these, these players who would band together in these small numbers, they knew how to do just one thing good. They knew how to do hearts and minds to the population. Everybody loved them. You're cheering for the underdog. Even though the underdog's giant and the, all of these major military forces, it's almost like cheering for the militia against the army. But the militia was always winning. And the militia would win in ways that you'd never see it coming. For example, oh, so they use voice communications. And there's this bug in the game where the sheep would go, ah. And the processing had to be distributed between the server and the client. So the desktop client would spike the sound of the processor for a sheep. Oh, OK. So they would go, hey, we would like to buy all the sheep on the server. And they would. And then when the battle would start, they disable their video, their audio cards because they didn't need them. They're using IRC, it's a little chat communications anyway. And this giant battle would start, and they poured in like a thousand sheep, and all of a sudden everybody with a with an audio card enabled because they're all talking to each other on their their command and control tools. Their processors would spike, and they'd stand there as the army of the weak it would slowly run up. 
and kill them. <laughs> because they're lagging. They're still lagging. They can barely move. They got almost no resources, and the 14-4 modem is trying the best it can to get them there. But this guy's computer's speaking. And we see that throughout the MMO process all the way up until today. Even today in EVE Online, they, they have organizations where this metagame takes place, and almost every major battle, and they have battles of 5,000, 6,000 people, human beings that are fighting in from their basement in these giant maps. Well, yeah, I mean, I have one of those basements. The thing is, is that they're able to organize that, and yet almost all of it is being driven from the metagame politics and the metagame government, the metagame business. So when you're doing simulations, science fiction does this to think people too. It gets you thinking, okay, if we're gonna compete, we're gonna really compete. And almost all of the real politics and diplomacy, government, business is taking place outside of the game, much as it does everywhere else. If you're gonna simulate this, then do it within the context of the metagame, not just the game. Everybody focuses on what a game does. But as I've seen when I go to different war games and other types of activities, when you're game designing in military culture for asymmetric warfare, particularly irregular warfare, don't design your game. Design your metagame. Because if the guy's able to bribe that guy with a Starbucks coffee and get what he wants, that ain't a whole lot different than what we're seeing everywhere else. And with that, I'll kind of get all my cards up and thank everybody very much. Wow.